Within 12 months, we had two or three notices of eviction because I'd been playing really loudly. The music I was playing in my first group, which is when I was a teenager, which was in the mid 80s, was like cowpunk kind of stuff. When I finally got to see friends who were playing guitar, I thought it was pretty cool. And also the, the girls seemed to be a lot more attracted to rock and roll than standing up with a French horn in a 50-piece orchestra. My favourite drummer is Fred Bello. And um, when I discovered him with the Little Walter band, I'd, um, I loved everything he was doing. He was different from your normal blues drummer. Even though he was playing in that vein like a lot of the other guys, he was different. I was pretty much, you know, obsessed by blues. I started looking for the blues records and when I found the real thing, like Howling Wolf's version of You're Gonna Wreck My Life and uh, Smokestack Lightning and all these things that were songs that I'd heard other people play, there was like no comparison, you know, it was way more interesting and aggressive and frightening and, and tough and scary and, you know, it was it really appealed to me in a big way. I'd save up my money and buy um, a record, a vinyl record. But then on the back it'd have who he played with and who he was influenced by and maybe even a cousin or something like that. So. But, so the more I read up on the harmonica stuff, the more I kept coming across names like Sonny Bill Williams and Sonny Terry, Little Walter and all those people. Um, and I put stacks of 20 cent pieces to slow down the, the record as it turned so I could slow the music down to a, to a point where I could actually hear the notes of the guitar. And from there I answered an ad on um, 3PBS to join this band. It turned out to be this group called the Checkerboard Lounge Blues Band. I always knew that I was going to go to the roots side of all the music. And I spent time playing in America, in Austin, Texas and stuff like that because it was a bit of an obsession with Austin as a music place. And I'd always wanted to sing too so I sort of dabbled with that as well in that Checkerboard group but it wasn't until I left that group, I started Collard Greens and Gravy and I was the main singer and kind of main uh, you know, front person in that group. Um, who's the guy? So his name's Chris Wilson. Do you know Chris Wilson? Of course I know Chris Wilson. Who doesn't? Really? He needs a, he sacked his band? Yeah. Would you be interested? Of course I am. Now one time I was in Austin, I was at a bar and um, James Cotton, who was the harmonica player with we well, had a huge crew of his own, but the harmonica played with Muddy Waters. Just walks in and starts playing the pokies you know, in the bar. And I was like, is that, is that James Cotton? It's like, he comes in here all the time, he lives around the corner. So, of course, I did the thing, what I had to do. I felt compelled, like, you know, you know sort of like moths to a light. I sort of just gravitated over towards him and then had to tell him how much I loved him, basically. And he took it all in his stride, but it was more to do with, oh, thank you very much, um, you know. Do you reckon you could have kind of let me get back to playing my pokey song? So, um, you know, the Redliners had a great singer frontman, Rod Payne, who still today has a Rod Payne in the full time of us. But, um, so, but I wanted to try and do that, so I started being in the fly by night. As we ended up selling a lot of albums overseas, and as a result, did a number of tours off the back of that in Europe. Ben and I have been working together on and off over the last probably 10 or more years, really. Ian's band, uh, Collard's Green, some sort of gravy, um, has been around for a long time, and they were, you know, obviously have always been a bit of a benchmark blues band in Australia. I was playing the Dead Natives, and ah, I finally got to see Ian Collard's band, and I loved Ian's earthiness, organic, real, hard on your sleeve stuff. Real, doesn't get any more real than that. It's sometimes hard to find people who listen you know, and understand where you're going with something. You know. And the same with Jason on drums, you know, he's just a very, very good drummer. And he listens, and he understands. He's got, and he's um, he's very adaptable. You know, he'll listen, and he'll change something very subtly to make it work. If you're doing something, you know. I think it's really important in this music to pay attention to the details, you know, because if you don't, it all starts to sound the same. 
Anyway, so I always wanted to play then and I always wanted to play with Ben. And then years later, I get a phone call from Ben just to fill in now and again with his band, which was great. And then he gave me this one particular call. He said, I've got this band with Ian Collard. He invited me along to a jam and I turned up and it was, it was godly. So once we decided we were going to get a drummer and that was going to be the setup, and we initially had a thought of not using a bass player. That was kind of like a bit of a sort of a... Uh, an idea and a focus as well. The sound is very reminiscent of what they were doing in the very early 50s um, before electric bass became popular. There's a lot of old, there's an old fashioned style of playing blues and that raw style blues where there is no bass player and one of the guitarists used to keep, or both of them used to keep a heavy bottom end to try and rep, you know, a duplicated bass to a certain degree. Um, and some of the recordings that really inspired us were things by, um, in particular one record by a guy called Jerry McCain, who's a great ha harp player from Alabama, who's got this record called Choo Choo Rock that I've always really liked. Because the Jerry McCain recordings were always, you know, there was always a really raw element to them. And they were a bit nasty sort of sounding. There's always a bit of like, a, there was a, some, so, so, you know, somehow kind of dangerous. We just want to make something that's really raw. Even if you do sort of try and do a pretty faithful rendition of what you're hearing on the record, it's always going to come out sounding different. It's always going to have your stamp on it anyway. And music to me has to be selfish first, to a certain degree. It's got to be selfish. Um, because if you don't love it, you can't expect anyone else to love it. So you've got to love it yourself first. You know, it's a live recording, so three at once, no multi-tracking, no um, take this out and redo that track or just do the drums or just do the bass again. It's, it's all happening at once. So if there's a mistake, all stop, all start again. But uh, it's, it's aggressive sounding music and uh, you know, trashy in some ways. You know. It's all been recorded live in, in the same way that you know the records that we've been inspired by were recorded. People can see that you're you mean, you mean it when you do it too, and that's very important, you know. I try to get inside. Empathy is the best thing to describe it as. You've got to empathise with the musician you're bouncing off. And I try to get right in the guts of what the guy's doing, and I find... And it's weird, it's weird. the crowd always knows when you're doing it too, because you, when, when you do lose yourself in your music and, and you, you go into another world or you're in that zone, Coincidentally, everyone claps more. It's, you know, I think um, the more you're into your art, the more they appreciate it.